I would like to ask um, all of the panelists to, to come to the table. Hmm? The title of the, um, this, pa this um, panel is very well known. We send out some questions um, formulated by Professor Sobolc Marko, who is from Col Columbia University, originally from Nierschig. <coughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's a very direct trajectory between Nierschig and, and New York. Um, yes, uh, and, and um, Mr. Minister was not properly informed that this is not the beginning, rather uh, we are towards the ending of the summer university, but it's an ongoing debate. And up until now, we were concentrating mostly, um, mainly, on the relationship between the European Union, the big changes um, occurring within the European Union, and um, the continuation, a possible continuation of Eastern enlargement. Even within this, this large, large topic, the main focus was on former Yugoslavia and um, Western Balkans. So we had wonderful experts, wonderful presentations. Um, even politicians came from Kosovo, and online we saw Vesna Pusic and Serbian um, ex-ministers. And so it was a very rich discussion. But it was not up until now a theoretical, not very academic, not very theoretical um, <coughs> gathering. Now we got this idea from Sabolc um, to discuss the unknown unknown, which came um, to the picture with uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld about 20 years ago. He put it on the table when he was um, in charge in the US administration. And ever since, it pops up. But I think it became more actual today than ever before. So before we start, um, and it's up to you who, who starts first, maybe can we get the questions on the screen? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Sabolch, maybe you should say a few words. Why did you suggest to this particular um, Egy kinyomtatva hozatok föl egy példányt, jó? Ah. Yeah, we, have, we, have it, we have it printed out. Yeah. So why, why should we talk about today, with including politicians, experts, um, physicists, um, students, and then I will introduce the panel afterwards, yeah? Okay. So why unknown unknown? So first of all, uh, thank you very much to, to welcoming us uh, uh, at Kőszeg again. Uh, Kőszeg is a unique place, a uh, unique place for you and for me, because it allows a broad discussion. Uh, I'm an I'm exception here. I'm an astrophysicist and biophysicist. Um, and I think, I think it is very rare <coughs> uh, opportunity and occasion where um, different uh, views can be shared and actually synthesized into a single view. So uh, I thought that that dealing with the unknown is is something where we all connect, yeah, uh, because because the unknown is a is a very dangerous place, but unknown itself is extremely valuable. Uh, did you actually know that uh, uh, investing uh, in research can produce? on the average 20 to 60% return. That's, that's unheard of on the stock market, except in rare occasions. Yeah? The problem with this investment is you can't geolocate. Yeah? So uh, thinking about how to do it, thinking about how to do it uh, in the triangle of, of um, politics, the decision maker, humanities, the actual impact and and scientist, it can be really a um, really a powerful way to think about it. So that that's the origin of the idea, and and if we appreciate the subtle difference 
between acquiring new knowledge and using acquired knowledge. They look the same from far away, but close by, they are very different. Then, then we can appreciate how to support it, how to engage in it, and how to have a better future through it. Yes. Here, um, the surprise is an answer to a question we forgot to ask. We did not ask. Um, <coughs> um, from a famous um, um, mathematician, Ron Atkin. Now um, we are living in a time of uncertainties and dangers and tur turbulence, but but the questions we forgot what we did not ask, are really mounting, accumulating. So I would like to ask any of you, um, dear Tibor, or if you don't want to start, we can ask um, whoever. So how, how do you live with this unknown unknown? In politics, in physics or sciences, as a student, as an advisor, and, and global guru, um, as a head of Globsec. Um, so how, how is it in your everyday life? Hmm? Yes, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me. I think it's mainly uh, about resilience, and there's a, there's a big debate nowadays in, in Europe or probably in other parts of the world on, on resilience. What does it mean, social re resilience, and how can uh, an, an individual be resilient, because that's, that's the answer to the challenges of, uh, of the unknown unknown. If you are resilient, you are well prepared for, for any sudden changes or even some unexpected, not pleasant turnovers and, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, um, what is important in, in that respect is it, it's, it's a little bit similar to the, to the unexpected changes in the labor market, for instance. Everybody is talking about that in, in, in the next 50 years, there will be fundamental changes due to digitalization and all the other things. So what kind of jobs will remain and uh, what kind of jobs will disappear? And I think it's, it's not, I mean, from the point of view of the education or from the point of view of the individual, uh, this is not the most important question. The most important question is that what kind of skills do we have to, to, to possess in order to, to address those challenges? If, a, if a, a job disappears, you can change to another job because you have very resilient social skills, for instance. You speak foreign languages, you, you are uh, uh, sociable, you can express your feelings, you can discuss uh, controversial topics in a peaceful way, and so on and so forth. So I, I would say that uh, the unknown unknown can be addressed by good social skills, uh, at least in politics, in, in society, in, in human communities. Yes, uh, but in, in politics, if I may say, uh, you have apparatus, you have administration, you have a system, then something or someone shows up who was not known and was not expected, it mi the, the apparatus or the reaction time um, might be frozen or uh, you know, some, some kind of um, a havoc, mo more than uncertainty can occur. Like a Magyar Peter shows up, nobody heard of, nobody knew. We still don't know who he was, who he is, and, and, and it, he completely changed for a while the scene. Um, but we can, we can come back to this. So it, it, there, are, there can be um, unexpected changes of which the individual, uh, I completely agree with you, can be and has to be, we have to be resilient and ready. And education and, and that kind of workshop discussions could help us to, to prepare for this more and more unknown. Okay, that is what, for example, our institute should do, preparing ourselves and then our, our surrounding, our community, larger, etc., for that big change which is occurring. But there are larger structures 
which is not only up to the individual reaction. So that is maybe, maybe in the second round, we can come back to this. Orshoya Ratsova, Rats or she, used to be, um, and I ask um, Granty, she was doing research with us, and we are still um, in good contact. Or she, how is it, and she is the, one of the directors of Globsec, um, a, a global think tank located in Slovakia. So, so how is it in your case, Orsi? Thank you. Thank you, Ferenc. Uh, so I wanted to say that we are talking about the unknown and, and the future. So what we are trying to do is obviously predict it because it has become very valuable to know what's coming. And there is an entire industry uh, built on it. And that's what I wanted to touch upon to build a couple of practical examples. Uh, for example, the political risk sector uses terms nowadays like geostrategy, geoeconomics, and and so on, which are not completely new terms. Political risk, economic risk analysis has existed for a while, but because of the geopolitical complexities and how it impacts uh, multinational corporations and so on, it impacts everyone. So we are trying to kind of find out what are the risks and what is the likelihood of these risks happening. Uh, and there are a number of consultancies as well as think tanks. Globsec is one of them, but the World Economic Forum publishes every year a risk report where they identify top risks. I did bring a couple of uh, examples if, if you're interested. Uh, and it's interesting, it's a mixture uh, of, of these risks. I can tell you a few examples. One of the consultancies identifies uh, US and itself as a top risk, which practically means that there is an election election year happening and it has global consequences naturally it doesn't just impact the US but uh, we all have to watch out what's happening then other of course geo geographical risks uh, that are top on the on the list are the Middle East as well as Ukraine is still there and those who specifically deal with supply chains and technological race as we all do is also the developments uh, in Asia as well as Africa because of the high dependence on uh, rare earth elements and critical raw materials that is increasingly shaping how the future and how how global power relations are going to look like. And it impacts, it doesn't just impact governments, but impacts companies. It impacts all of us as well, as we, as we saw. For example, the, could we have predicted uh, COVID-19? I'm just throwing a couple of questions out there. If a similar pandemic happened tomorrow, would we be better prepared for it? What have we learned from this is also an important thing. May I, may I ask you, how does it affect your, your institution? Do you have um, problems with this? Do you, your reaction time in Globsec is fast enough or, or did it cause further turbulences? So are you prepared? That, that's a very, very good, very good uh, provocative question. Uh, yes, of course, everything uh, impacts us. Uh, we are a think tank uh, with offices also outside of Slovakia. We have colleagues in Ukraine as well. So naturally, the war does impact us. All we can do, I think, is keep informed and prepa prepare resilient strategies. Yes. Before I give the word back to Mr. Minister, I would like to ask Sean Cleary. Sean Cleary, everyone knows in this room, more or less. Um, he's um, a very frequent visitor of IASC and COSEG and our Blue Sky conferences, and he's a member of the advisory board and an advisor of many different kind of bodies in the world, including governments and the UN and the Diplomatische Academy in Vienna. So um, um, we have been talking about this with, with Sean, about this this accumulating turbulence and our lack of capability to react properly, we mean, I mean, in the academia, in, in the public life, NGO world, etc., etc. So, Sean, um, anything um, positive you can? <laughs> well, I hope so, but I, but I think one's got to be realistic about the nature of the challenge. You've made the point originally that Rumsfeld defined. <clears throat> and, you know, what he said at the time, everyone's forgotten. He was asked 
about the lack of evidence linking the Iraqi government to the supply of weapons of mass destruction to terrorist groups. Now, the Iraqi government was not supplying weapons of mass destruction to terrorist groups. It was doing all sorts of other terrible things, but it wasn't doing that. And Rami came up with a very interesting response. He said, reports that say something hasn't happened are always interesting to me. Because as we know, there are no knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns, the things we don't know we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it's the latter category that tends to be the difficult one. So this is not actually a terribly intelligent statement. Rumsfeld was a highly intelligent man in reality, not when he was Secretary of Defense. But this is not, but this is not an intelligent statement. And that you've got on the back of the thing, so I'm not going to waste time on it. That's just a distillation of this. But I want to show you, in the context of what Ors has just been talking about, back in the immediate period when Britain had left Europe, one of the things we were asked to do was to go and have a look at what was going to happen to the EU as a consequence of this. Now, if you think back to the time, the minister will remember very well, many of the rest of you will as well, there was a, the notion of a Frexit, there was the notion of all sorts of other countries leaving. Now I'm going to show you, these are the original scenarios. I'm not going to spend time on them, but these are the original scenarios, and you'll see they weren't very good. Right? We used decision optimization software, we did all sorts of clever things on it, but they weren't very good. So the first one was Berlin holds it together, which is more or less what happened. Angela Merkel held it all together. The second was a formal split. So here you had a backlash among political uh, German voters, and that led to a fractioning of Europe. This was a very interesting scenario. The notion was that there was going to be a sort of a German core, a fractured South, <coughs> which would break away out of the Greek model in terms of the crisis that we'd seen uh, in Greece during the financial crisis, and that Britain together with Germany, together with the Scandinavians, would sort of have a third fraction. Now, very interesting idea. There's nothing the matter with it. It was highly creative. It was well worth doing. But it had nothing to do with what happened in reality. This one is sort of what we were exploring yesterday, where the con dividing lines between NATO and the EU become confused and precisely where the EU ends and NATO begins. And Ukraine has complicated that particular space in particular ways. And then, of course, the fourth one in this was the end of Europe. Now, that's what Napoleon said about this. In politics, stupidity is not a handicap. That's not directed at the ministry. <laughs> <laughs> but the important thing about all of this is why. And the reason is, as you know, better than I do, complex systems are what they are. First of all, they're defined by many strongly interdependent variables. Secondly, there are feedback loops where a change in one variable results either in amplification or in the dampening of the change. Thirdly, there's a propensity to chaotic behavior, fractal geometry and self-organizing criticality. And the consequence of all of this is that there are multiple metastable states within complex systems. And that's quite inevitable. There's nothing you can do about it. As a result, there's a non-Gaussian distribution of outputs, and that's why the Brexit scenarios weren't terribly successful, right? like any others. Complex adaptive systems are obviously yet more complex, so humanity embedded in the biosphere is a complex adaptive system. The problem is we don't have brains that can process all of that. And that's the ultimate limitation. <coughs> this summary here isn't quite correct, as all the physicists will know perfectly well, but broadly speaking, an arithmetic increase in the elements in the system leads to a geometric increase in the number of potential links and an exponential increase in the number of potential patterns. So long and short of it, <coughs> those numbers aren't quite correct, that's the algebra there, but broadly speaking, <coughs> the more you connect and that's what we did with globalization, the more unpredictable everything becomes. And the way in which humans respond to this 
is by using heuristics. Look what you're all doing. Look what we're doing. Why are we doing this? Because we know what this is. This is a panel discussion. Right? In a panel discussion, some people sit at the front, other people sit, you've no idea what's going to happen in the course of this. Right? There might be an earthquake, God forbid. <coughs> but all sorts of things might happen, but we're operating on the basis of a set of heuristics to make sense of the complexity that we can't possibly process. And that leads to the problems that governments have to deal with all the time. There's a fundamental mismatch between the complexity of the natural systems in which we're embedded and our limited capacity to understand their workings. And that makes it very difficult to devise sound policies. Our understanding and responses are limited by our rigid reductionist mental models. We tend to be monocausal in our approach. We say A caused B. And then we simplify in order to make sense. But the reality is that the policies that we adopt play out in the dynamic environment and lead to all sorts of unintended consequences. And that's why the minister spoke of resilience, because you can't plan adequately for the purpose. And then, of course, there's real politics. Much policy that emerges from legislation is involved in compromises and trade-offs. And even well-conceived policies give rise to perverse effects, and that breeds public cynicism, distrust, and resistance. I've got more, but I'll stop here. Sure, sure. We come back to you, but I think now maybe it's a good time, Tibor, to respond, if you wish so. Okay. I absolutely agree. Um, just, just going back to, to my follow-up question, um, I think Harold Macmillan was the was the British Prime Minister when he was asked that what is what was the the most difficult in politics, and his answer was uh, the events, my dear boy, the events. So that's that's what we are talking about. So yeah, exactly. So uh, that's that's the that's the unknown in politics. What will happen next? If we make a decision, uh, it uh, it can bring uh, very good results and, and consequences and huge popular support and so on and so forth. But, uh, but there is no political decision without any damage. I mean, even the optimal political decision is, make, is making some damages in certain social groups or ideological groupings or, or religious uh, subcultures and so on and so forth. So, uh, the the most difficult uh, part of politics is making decisions and defend and hold up the 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 continuation and all the concomitants of of that decision in order to to be able to govern a society or a community and that's the most important just because as uh, as uh, mr cleary said that uh, there's a there's a realm of the unknown consequences, sometimes sudden, unexpected, and unpredictable consequences. But somehow a politician has to, has to navigate himself or herself or, or themselves uh, in those circumstances. And, uh, and I think that's, that's why it is, uh, it is um, very, very interesting. Um, but at the same time, it, it can be very fluid and, and uh, very unpredictable for, for the society. But there's a link. I mean, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't neglect the, the cultural aspect of that because uh, taking this uh, uh, uncertainty element, um, traditions, bonds, I mean, uh, human bonds, uh, communities, the strength of communities, um, the 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 social skills of a, of a community can be decisive how a politician or how a politician and the other members of the society can overcome the difficulties and and that is I think it's it's very important it can it can it can determine the fate of the community and and the trajectory of the country uh, at the same time among difficulties and, 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 and let me let me ask you how are we doing hungarians in that regard to compare to others in terms of reacting I, if, yeah yes honestly 
as, 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 as a member of the government. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I, I can give a certificate on the Hungarian society now from... <laughs> I don't know, I think we have, we have some special cultural characteristics which, is not known, which are not known in Europe overall regarding our, um, our past, our, um, the, the element of, of our educational um, curricula and, and, uh, and of course our, our interhuman uh, relationships. Um, we, we, I, I usually say that while institutionally the Hungarian political system based on ger German patterns basically, so we are a chancellor democracy, very strong prime minister, even in constitutional background, and, uh, and the institutions uh, were uh, established when this German way of thinking was the dominant way of thinking in the early 90s, uh, the the polit uh, political developments uh, have a kind of Mediterranean character. I mean, the political parties are person-based and, uh, and uh, we have very strong political personalities and even the voters um, want to see strong political personalities and not institutions. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on, on personal achievements and. Uh, and personal characteristics, and I, I think I would say that that's a, that's a South European uh, feature of, of the European political culture. Thank you. Um, may, I, may I turn to the younger generation? Um, <coughs> um, Benedek Fohazi, who is the representative of Istvan Bibos, famous Istvan Bibos College of Advanced Studies, and uh, fortunately we have been um, cooperating more, more actively in the last year and I used to be, and many of us have our roots there in a way or in another from the mid 80s, or early 90s. Um, and the question in our discussions of in, during the last year often arose um, about social responsibility of young um, generations, especially those who will who are going to be kind of leaders in that be in academic um, ways or in politics? Uh, do you feel, um, Benedek, that um, what I'm, I'm suggesting, my assumption is right, that uh, the the number and the intensity of unknown unknown occasions is are, are growing? Do you face in your life in Bibo uh, College's life more? Uh, of this uncertainty, or you have a, a safe haven and and um, and 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 a calm, uh, relaxed life. Well, thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you for being able to speak at this panel. Uh, I'm quite humbled by my uh, partners here, uh, but I'm more humbled by the fact that we are speaking about unknown unknowns because I think it's a very uh, distinct and special philosophical concept. Uh, we can speak about policy implementation, resilience, uh, risk analysis and risk management in closed uh, models, but these are known unknowns. Unknown unknown is a, is a very distinct uh, concept of a void space uh, where we assume there is some kind of a risk or some kind of uh, an effect that we don't know. Uh, it demands a very different kind of approach uh, to understand this. And I think the key, uh, key uh, um, um, approach to understand this concept uh, is resilience, but it's more uh, a behavior-based uh, resilience and not a skill-based resilience. It's, it's, it's a state of mind where you accept that uh, individualistic access uh, to reality and to truth is, uh, is not possible. Uh, I think it, uh, it evokes uh, a cooperative style, uh, an interdisciplinarity in science, uh, deliberation in politics. Uh, it, uh, it evokes discussion regarding those kind of concepts uh, which have a meaning, but the meaning is not accessible individually on a personal level. Uh, we have to have this kind of uh, uh, plural um, um, power and, and, and knowledge structure uh, to construct these notions, which can build resilience, 
uh, and we are living in a democracy, and democracy's dynamics always reproduce some kind of a struggle that we have to overcome. Uh, and to, to, to cruise back for the question, yes, uh, I think that in student communities we are facing this, uh, this challenge because we, are, uh, we already found the democracy, we already found liberty, we already found equality, we didn't acquire it. Uh, it was given to us. So I think that we have to, 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 to use this kind of method uh, of cooperation and discussion and uh, dialogue and dialectics to, to, to reach the core meaning of, uh, of, of these concepts. Yeah. Thank you very much. Before I would give back the word to the panelists, may I ask a dear audience to, to make comments or, or ask um, questions? Yes, please. Joseline or Joseline? Yes, yeah, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm an entrepreneur, but also an academic. Uh, I just want to reflect on two small things, not to take too much time. If I take the Dutch context, uh, I think on one side, uh, the unknown unknowns. We try to tackle it, try to tackle it because of our special system of poldering. And poldering is a system uh, from centuries ago where farmers had to cooperate. So we're known for cooperating employee, employers organizations with the governments, which always takes a lot of time for all decisions to be made. But if decisions are made, they're very uh, laid in society. On the other hand, which is, sounds a little bit like a paradox, but it's not. I think we're known for our entrepreneurial mindset, which has to do also about resilience, proactivity, 21st century skills, etc. Um, and I wouldn't say that Holland is the best example in the world for these kind of things, but we have these two different systems, and especially the entrepreneurial mindset to start with young people at college. So to make sure that you have some risk propensity, resilience, uh, looking for ch uh, the opportunities, etc. So I just want to address that. Good to hear a voice from the Golden West, as is very rare in these days, unfortunately here. Uh, so others, we have we had wonderful presenters and, 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 and lecturers from, from our southern and, um, and eastern neighbors, from Albania, from Macedonia. Um, um, please, please, and shortly introduce yourself because Mr. Minister doesn't know who we are. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, panel. Uh, I am Mentor Beja. I come from Albania. I'm uh, a, a senior lecturer at uh, Alexander Moiseu University in Duras. Actually, Alexander Moiseu lived uh, in Vienna, not far from here, <laughs> during the whole the time. Uh, uh, now, it is very much part of human nature to try and understand and predict the future. And since, at least since Gilgamesh, we know that. People are trying to understand uh, the future and forecast and predict the future. And we have uh, even uh, scientific disciplines and pseudo-scientific disciplines, future studies, for example, uh, that try to, to predict the future. Now, uh, uh, this, this is not new. What is new is that we have to factorize the role of the digitalization and the, the speed with uh, which uh, AI is developing. How can we uh, utilize and leverage this kind of developments in predicting the future and understanding uh, the future? This is the question. On the other hand, I Ivana. Ivana is um, a member um, of, the, of the Institute from Serbia. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm a research fellow here. That I ask, and I wanted to ask a question to all the panelists, or maybe one of you, whoever wants uh, to address this issue. I wanted to ask you if you think that complexity is really an ideological, it can be an ideological term that is really obfuscating the uh, kind of path to solutions. So, uh, how about uh, that we think about uh, opposing this uh, notion to the notion of simplicity? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ZKL doesn't need any introduction. Thank you, uh, Laszlo Karvalic, 
also a uh, research fellow via as an information historian and uh, cultural heritage uh, expert. And I have a simple question. Sean was talking about the individual limits of uh, brain capacity. And Sabocs was talking about the importance of uh, the acquisition of new knowledge to come closer to make unknown known. What do you think? Uh, <coughs> if we can somehow radically multiplicate the numbers uh, the number of uh, uh, people who uh, <coughs> who are individual um, uh, and intellectual worker, um, uh, even if it, uh, they are s uh, 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 representatives of science or the scientific guild or citizen scientists um, uh, or, or, or other knowledge producing um, um, uh, entities, uh, uh, joining into one uh, knowledge producing mega machine as sometimes Louis Mumford was talking about. So are we coming closer with this simple mathematical um, um, uh, numbering, growing the brains uh, involved in um, uh, knowledge production? You, you can imagine how is it when Zekel is asking a not so simple question. You can <laughs> that's, that's, that's. So I think, okay, well now, please. So, um, uh, it's fantastic. Um, uh, so, I experienced the unknown unknown on this panel. Um, so, so I, I would like to inject uh, two um, provocative ideas um, and, uh, and, and see how, how the panel reacts. So, the first one is uh, we heard uh, kind of the, the dark side of uh, unknown unknown, yeah? I look at unknown unknown as a fantastic resource. I consider myself a miner of unknown unknown. Yeah? So, so I think unknown unknown is the greatest source of wealth on earth. So, so uh, we, should, we should take a positive uh, view of that yeah? uh, as a resource, as, as a fantastic opportunity. The second idea is, is uh, I admit, and that's why um, it's fantastic to think about it. I admit that I found uh, politics, policy, law, I just didn't understand why people do it. I, I, found, it, I found it totally boring until, until I recognized that this is the most fantastic endeavor because I had a revelation. Law and lawmaking is programming. It's programming the most fantastic resource on earth it's programming a society. It's, it's a computer we built and we didn't build yet. We are, we are programming a computer where none of the processors have the complete knowledge. None of the processors uh, actually execute the program the same way. But a lawmaker is actually creating a program that is running on a society. And then that society interprets and, and, and compiles that program and then, then functions. So, so th this is the most creative endeavor I can imagine. So the moment I had this fundamental realization, I find, I find policy the most creative, fantastic thing. It's extremely risky. Actually, um, I, I, think, I think my revelations are, are kind of quasi-static, but, but, but the, the moment uh, actually came with interacting with Ayask and, 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 and Ferry, the decisive... <laughs> 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 so, so, so he didn't know I will answer that, yeah. So it was not a provocative question. Um, so, so what I would like to inject here is that, that put these two provocative points into context with each other. Yeah? So here is, is the second most valuable resource a nation can have, the unknown unknown. The first, as a father of four, I can say that children are the most amazing renewable resource on this, on this planet and of a nation. But, but unknown unknown, is, is extremely valuable. And then we have this programming language of, of policy making law, system of laws. 
So I see that since the value of the unknown unknown is not recognized, the programming language is shortchanging the society. Um, I want to just bring up a few ideas where I think we could have a better programming of the society. So one is our children are born to be brave, to research the unknown unknown, yeah? and they lose that ability as they grow up. So we should help them not to lose it. Second, um, I heard my colleagues at the most prestigious university calling the unknown unknown a fishing expedition. This is euphemism for you don't know what you are doing. Yeah? So, so every system that is based on proposals, grants, where you ask for money with clear goals, is refuting the value of unknown unknown, implicitly or explicitly. Every system where only projects are supported and not brilliant minds, refuting the value of unknown unknown. So, so who, can we, who can we have a society that can mine the value of unknown unknown, that can let children grow into the most amazing miners of the unknown unknown? Um, who can we program this? So, so please think about that. Um, yes, if, before the others will continue in the panel, any quick reaction, um, Professor Bogardi. <coughs> Thank you very much. It was very interesting to listen to the debate. It came as idea as, if, uh, as recent as a few minutes ago that if I look back to human history, I realize that all societies developed religion. They had gods or gods, and uh, I would say that the huge amount of unknown unknowns were replaced by, by, by something uh, divine, uh, which you uh, pray for, and then uh, the goodwill will help you. Uh, now, if I take uh, a bit quicker than that, uh, we had the Industrial Revolution, the 20th century, enormous uh, gain in knowledge, and now here is this illustrious panel who says us, our brain is unable to solve certain problems. We are still touching the unknown, unknown uh, limit. It's still how much is it unknown, unknown, we still do not know. And I'm questioning whether it would give a revival of religiousness, which may be uh, documented in the extreme religious activities which we can observe, or uh, how can we uh, develop, let's say, a less religious-based ultimate trust in ourselves to deal with these unknown unknowns and have a more uh, optimistic view of that we may find some solutions and some unknown unknowns will be known knowns. Thanks. Thank you, wonderful questions. I, I, I trust that we cannot answer all of, of this, but um, you have a chance, uh, each of you, two, maximum three minutes. Hmm? Or the panel is Yes. So, so um, sorry. Um, so, so, that's a fantastic, fantastic idea, fantastic question. So, if you look at, look at uh, the answer what humanity is giving uh, up to date, we had hive minds, we call them teams, and we are struggling with the fact that humans are vectors. And when you add vectors, uh, two plus two might not be four, but might be zero, yeah? If the two vectors are anti-aligned. So, so humans are added as vectors. So building a hive mind is very important to, to, to deal with complexity, to, to mine, mine the, the unknown. And, uh, and this programming language of, of, of law making humans cooperate is critical to build that hive mind. And now we have a second constituents. We are integrating silicon and biology. Yeah? We are very close to integrate silicon and biology. And, and hive minds of that kind, AI, silicon, can be, can be a solution to this. Yes. 
we heard some very interesting questions uh, about complexity and simplicity and some assumptions about politics being the most wonderful um, opportunity for, for, for creative um, thinking and acting um, and a wonderful job. Um, any, any reactions? Yes, go. I think <coughs> unlike the, the common sense usually thinks uh, to be complex is much easier than to be simple. Uh, in politics, probably the, the most difficult uh, part of the job is to make things simple in order to convince citizens for acting together for, for something. Uh, that means that uh, uh, the, the most difficult part of, of the political process is, is to to reduce the, the complexity of a complex phenomenon into a simple, understandable opinion or fact, and at the same time to preserve the most, I would say, most noble parts of that complexity in order not to lose something essential in that. And of course, there's always a debate on that, that uh, while, for instance, the, the populism, the political populism is the, probably the most sensitive part of, of that making complex things simple, that populists uh, reduce the, the essence of uh, complexity into a simple fact, and, some, and during this process they distort the meaning or, or the essence of, of that subject, for instance, Brexit. The, uh, the, the counterparts in this, in this robust political debate um, attacked each other with, uh, with, by saying that, uh, that uh, the other part is um, uh, making simple facts too complex in order not to understand, the, the, making it non-understandable to the people or uh, making complex things too simple, reducing them, and uh, and given a distorted uh, interpretation of a very complex social phenomenon, and and and, and it's a, it's a very important issue. I, I think it's it's not simply an ideological label that oh you are populist so you you see um, things too simple uh, because um, in a democracy. It's, uh, it's one of the essential mechanisms of the political process is to make complex things simple. But at the same time, there's a, a clear danger that uh, during, uh, by, by making it simple, you, you just steal the, uh, the, the most uh, important intellectually or materially or also uh, the most important parts or the core of that uh, phenomenon, and uh, that's why I think it is a um, it, it is very difficult to be simple and at the same time simple and smart, or simple and understandable and sophisticated. Still, sophisticated. On the other hand, uh, however, our our purpose was to talk about the unknown unknowns. I have some doubts about the possibility of talking about unknown unknowns because if those are unknown unknowns. How can we speak about the unknown unknowns? <laughs> we, we don't know them because they are unknown unknowns. So, and, and politics usually deal with known unknowns and sometimes happens unknown unknowns. But, uh, but I mean, intellectually we are, we are prepared for the known unknowns. And of course we have to be, uh, uh, we have to be uh, prepared also for, for addressing those unknown unknown challenges. Uh, at the moment when when they become known unknowns, while they are unknown unknowns, we can't address them because we don't know them because they are unknown unknowns. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I give back because I think the, 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 uh, the, for the very reason by what, what Ron, Ron Atkins suggested that maybe if the unknown becomes known, maybe it can occur to us that there we forgot to ask a question. So this is what can trigger, but it's a paradox, you're completely right. Yeah, but, but, yeah. I'm sorry to, to keep up your attention, but, but, the, but if it's true, 
then the most important question is uh, what we do when the unknown unknown becomes known unknown. So we, because we have the analogy, we, we have examples, we can go back to our, to our personal roots, for instance. Uh, so what do we use as a reaction or where are the resources of our uh, attitude to that fact when the unknown becomes unknown, how we identify as a known something. So we, we put the unknown at the moment when it becomes known in a basket, in a personal basket, in a historical basket, in a I don't know where. So, and I think that's the most important question. Great question to the other panelists. Uh, Sean. Um, I, you know, I, I, I want to offer you three things. <clears throat> One, Karl Popper, as everyone knows, famously said that the defining character of a scientific statement is that it's capable of falsification. Right? It's important to remember that. A statement that cannot be tested is not a scientific statement. It's a statement of belief, a statement of advocacy, a statement of many things else, but it's not a scientific statement. Secondly, these definitions are very, very tricky things. Yeah, the thing that you've got on the back of the piece of paper says an unknown unknown is a thing that we are neither aware of nor understand. If you're not aware of it, obviously you can't understand it because you're not aware of it. But the point that you made a few minutes ago is absolutely right because that is precisely the epistemological mine that we have at our disposal as a consequence of our ability to think. Part of the reason that we're not aware of certain things is because we haven't thought about them. Anyone here who knows anything about string theory knows why it emerged at a particular point in time in a particular context and hasn't been capable of being proven or disproven fundamentally up to this point in time. That's the nature, I think, of this sort of epistemological inquiry, which is endemic in this whole question. The second thing is you've got to bring a degree of humility to this whole discussion. There is the excitement of the possibility of exploration. There is the wonderful notion that children are born with an almost unlimited capacity to explore anything and we breed it out of them, or we educate it out of them. This is absolutely true, and it's highly destructive. But it's also the distinguishing feature between sociopathic individuals and people who can, in fact, cooperate in society. So you've got to find that balance as well. And then the last thought that I'd leave with you is a remark that's frequently attributed to both Einstein and Heisenberg, and I'm not sure which one of them actually used it first, it doesn't matter. But when one is trying to deal with a complex issue, render it sufficiently simply to make it comprehensible, but not more so. And that's the challenge. There's no answers to any of these things. You have to be able to take all of this on board simultaneously and live with the consequences. So, so fantastic, um, and, uh, and I'd like to, to react uh, um, to both of you. Um, so um, when, you, when you think about um, the unknown unknown, uh, I operate on a postulate that that cannot be proven, but in history it was always proven right, that the sea of unknown unknown is infinite. That's the only tenet we have to use. Yeah? So the, the moment you, you understand that the unknown unknown is infinite, you know that it's out there. Uh, you have to enable society to search for it. And that's the question. We don't know what we are searching for it, but we know who to enable search for it. That's, that's, a, that's a very, very scary thing because uh, there is an uncertain relationship between 
control and the ability to discover the unknown unknown. More control we exercise, less the ability to, to discover. Less, uh, less control we exercise, more the ability to discover. But less control is the scariest thing on Earth. So, so in a sense, we don't know what we are searching for, but if the sea is infinite, then we can find it. And that's why um, that, that, that mine is infinitely large. Yes, but I'm using one postulate. Thank you. I just wanted to throw in one little thing to think about. Uh, and that's the paradigmatic uh, approach regarding this uh, these apparition. Uh, and I think that uh, last year at the Blue Sky Conference, Norbert Crow had a very interesting presentation regarding his, uh, his uh, fusion uh, energy experiment, uh, for which he worked on the, the explanation, the scientific uh, 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 argumentation. Uh, so maybe the falsification criterion is only just a paradigmatic criterion. And uh, maybe these are anomalic, an anomalic apparitions uh, which further the, the, the development of knowledge and the paradigmatic shift. Uh, and the unknown unknown is, is, is something that we cannot really comprehend at the present time, but we can uh, let experts, scientists, uh, these spirited talents, uh, uh, to, to, to further research and to, to, to maybe shift our notion of interpretation, perception, reality. So, yeah, just... Yes. Just to follow up, because you mentioned less control, uh, and I think we didn't touch upon one of the questions about AI. Uh, and I do think uh, that there is enormous potential in it, but of course there are dangers that we all know and it's being addressed on the policy side uh, to regulate it and so on. But I think we don't really know where we are going with AI. It, the impact didn't happen as quickly as some people expected, that it will radically change a lot of professions. Uh, my personal experience, you know, doing research, writing policy recommendations, it did not change. Uh, at least I would like to say that humans can still better connect the dots as opposed to AI. It will probably change at some point since it's machine learning, but I think we are not there yet. So I think there is potential, but it's a question question when that's going to happen. So until then, I think it's key to encourage interdisciplinary dialogue. And this is what IAS does as well. And uh, it's not an easy thing, actually. It seems like, you know, one of the simplest things you can say. But it's actually very difficult to have a dialogue which uh, is, you know, uh, you have certain points, you are aims you're trying to reach because, uh, you know, between political scientists, natural scientists, it's not the same language necessarily that they speak. And even if, uh, let's say, we come up with a solution, it's the question on how you explain it. And this is what Minister Navracic said as well, that uh, you have to put it in an understandable way, which is, again, it's, it's not an easy thing. So I think these points are worth focusing on. Thank you very much. It has been a wonderful panel. Uh, last words, um, Sean and whoever. I, I, this, is a, this is a throwaway remark in response to the AI question and your comments on it right now. Uh, there is an article, I can't speak out of school on this one, so I'm going to have to be a little bit vague, but there is an article by two uh, significant Hungarians associated with the Academy, which is likely to be published in Nature in the next several weeks, which points to the fundamental challenge in respect of AI, which is actually the possibility of independent evolution. So if you think of the underlying challenge of high levels of connectivity in an open landscape today, there is absolutely no reason, based on what we have seen already, why you should not get a form of dry evolution in algorithmic formats, which will escape human control remarkably quickly. 
So the transformative potential effect, this is an unknown unknown. We don't know if it's going to happen. We don't know if it does happen, when it'll happen. We don't know under what circumstances. We don't know what controls we're going to have. But it is a, it is a fascinating thought, and it is going to be, I think, quite revolutionary when the debate actually starts around this issue. So, wonderful. Thank you very much. Anyone else, a last remark or, or message? Yeah? Uh, I hope uh, uh, you go away with more questions than you had before, <laughs> and uh, that was the goal. And uh, and I hope I hope you recognized there is a there is a tremendous value accessible to all in unknown unknown. And uh, please keep thinking and and then keep this fantastic place in Kursa going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Navratis, to participate in this for you unknown, um, unknown <laughs> <laughs> terrain that is really rare in, 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 the, in, in, in the life of, of politics. Last time we had, um, 11 years ago, Prime Minister Orban, he was answering uh, three questions from very similar audience. Um, it should happen more often, I guess. Now, what we had a lot of um, interesting discussions before this panel with um, Sabolch online and on telephone, and I have to tell you a little secret that it is a tipping point or a, 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 a kind of a conjecture uh, in his belief and in also my view between um, the two types of researchers. One is interested in doing research about the known unknown. Well, that's the safe field, yeah? We suppose that we know what we don't know, we, do, we, do, we collect statistics and then correct the theory and the methodology, but, but the other one is interested in the unknown unknown. And I think Sabolch believes that those are the real researchers. The other ones are making commentaries. Maybe it's, I'm too provocative, but don't forget that we are in the Institute of Questions, I ask, and you answer. So you got a lot of answers. Let's come back and, and, and continue tomorrow and next week and all the time. You are welcome in the, in the IASC online and offline terrain. Uh, thank you. A big applause to the panel.